to session two of today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Marian Rozek here today, uh, afternoon for me and whatever time it is in your time zone for you. Uh, and Marian will be telling us about recurrence in combinatorial versus classical dynamics. So whenever you're ready, Marian. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, the organizers, for this great workshop and for the invitation. So uh, this is part uh, of a uh, uh, project which started a few years ago with several people. And today I want to uh, speak about the last developments with my uh, uh, colleagues, uh, Roman Shednitsky, uh, Thomas uh, uh, Warner and Justin Thorpe, which just concerns this uh, recurrence aspect. Uh, but I'd like to start <clears throat> with uh, this uh, slide about combinatorial topology, because this is subject uh, known, uh, I guess, to uh, uh, most people very well. And uh, when we think about combinatorial topology, we typically think about uh, a simplicial complex or a cellular complex. And it has this double, uh, double nature. So on one hand, you can forget about this uh, uh, cellular structure or simplicial structure, and you are just left with the topological space with no location or your simplices or vertices or so on. On the other hand, you can uh, do the reverse. You can forget about the topology, and then you are left with this poset of uh, 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 faces, uh, which uh, is this combinatorial representation only of the uh, cellular uh, uh, space. So uh, when uh, you say, when I said this, that you forget about the topology, the topology is not the total truth, because actually, when you have a poset, you still have uh, the Alexandrov topology uh, uh, induced by that uh, poset structure. Uh, face, uh, uh, actually on any poset you have Alexandro topology. So in this case, on this face poset, you have Alexandro topology. And although this topology is in some sense very far from the uh, original topology because there is even uh, no bijection, and nevertheless, uh, it's not that far in terms of uh, uh, algebraic invariance because by McCourt's theorem, we know that uh, the homology and homotopy groups of this uh, strange Alexandrov topology are the same for uh, uh, the Alexandrov topology and uh, for the geometric representation topology. So now when we go uh, to uh, combinatorial uh, dynamics, uh, what comes to mind uh, is uh, just the, the combinatorial vector fields by Forman. So they were uh, already um, recalled here by Claudia. Uh, they come from uh, papers uh, by uh, Foreman. I prefer, instead of recalling the original definition, I prefer the equivalent definition, which just says that you have a partition of the collection of cells uh, in the cellular space into singletons and uh, doubletons where the doubletons have the condition that uh, one uh, phase should be uh, a face of the other element in the doubleton of codimension one. So when you look into this combinatorial representation, it's easy to draw it. But uh, let me mention here one peculiar uh, feature, which maybe not uh, does not come to mind immediately, but will be uh, uh, needed later. Namely, uh, both the singleton and this type of doubleton are examples of convex sets in the meaning of posets. So the convex set in a poset is a subset with the feature that if two elements are there, then everything in between is also there. So here, this is just trivially satisfied. For a sing singleton, there is nothing in between. For a doubleton, there is uh, also uh, nothing in between just by this dimension one condition. Uh, okay, so... Um, Now the dynamics, because it's a little bit hidden in Foreman's work and uh, uh, in the original Foreman's work, he did the dynamics just on the chains uh, in the simplicial setting. 
but uh, you can do the dynamics directly on the collection uh, of uh, cells. It is hidden in, in the foreman's work because he speaks about these paths which he needs uh, to do the, the Morse theory in the combinatorial setting. And from that path, we learned that actually there are not only these uh, directed arrows which come with the, uh, when you define the, the, uh, multi, uh, the combinatorial vector field, but with these paths, you're allowed to go from any uh, uh, end of an, uh, this, as what I call explicit arrow, anywhere to the boundary. So in this simple case, you just uh, can continue in the boundary and you get this uh, closed cycle in this directed graph. From the singleton, you can also go to the boundary. And it's reasonable also to add the loop here because remember uh, the, the singletons in, in Forman version of Morse theory correspond to critical cells and critical cells in classical dynamics correspond to stationary solutions of the gradient flow. So this way we obtain a directed graph and sometimes uh, it's convenient just to look into this in, in a purely combinatorial fashion. So uh, then defining this uh, uh, combinatorial vector field apart from these loops just reduces to reverting the directions of arrows in this uh, selected uh, vectors in the combinatorial vector field. So for this reason, I speak about the uh, explicit up arrow and implicit down arrows, which are hidden there, but usually are not, not drawn just to keep the uh, picture simple. Okay, so when we see a, a, a directed graph like this, uh, giving some feeling of motion, we, you immediately think about a classical dynamical system on this geometric representation, which has more or less the same behavior. You have a periodic orbit here in the boundary, a repelling stationary point in the middle and a trajectory which unspirals from these fixed points to where the uh, periodic trajectory. So uh, let's have a look again uh, into these two situations. On the left, we have this purely combinatorial version. On the right, we have the classical uh, dynamical system on a disk. Uh, what you can do on the left-hand side is you can look for strongly connected components of this directed graph. Uh, so we have two here. And when you collapse them to a point, you get uh, again a, a poset. In this case, very simple, uh, because uh, any, any loop is lost by, by a collapsing the strongly connected component to a point. You can do something similar in the classical case. So you have this uh, conley morse graph. The difference is that you have here these labels, which come from the Conley index, because uh, uh, these are uh, these uh, uh, morse sets are isolated invariant sets, and you have uh, Conley index defined for them. So the question is, could we do something similar on the left-hand side? And the answer is yes, if we have a Conley theory in this combinatorial setting. And this is what I worked with my colleagues uh, on for the last few years. So the answer is yes, we do have a Conley theory. We can add uh, these la uh, labels here as well. Uh, I will not recall this construction here. I had the opportunity to present this uh, a few times uh, uh, earlier. I only mentioned that in, in principle, everything looks be beautiful in the sense that you have uh, all the same uh, elements like in the classical Conry uh, theory. So Morse decompositions, attractors, lepelers, Morse equation, uh, connection matrix, uh, uh, the only difference is that we are used that isolated invariant sets are uh, closed, whereas here in the combinatorial setting, they need not be closed. And actually, there is this nice relation which translates the dynamics to topology, namely an isolated invariant set in the combinatorial setting. If it is closed, it has to be, uh, it's closed only if and only if it is an attractor, it's open if and only if it's a repeller. And uh, if it's neither attractor nor repeller, it has to be an intersection of an open or, or closed, end closed set. 
in that case, it's a um, convex set with respect to this uh, pos set. And this is just uh, the situation when you have non trivial both uh, the um, uh, stable and unstable manifold for such an isolated invariant set. But otherwise, things are uh, uh, very much uh, uh, similar. So when you see these similarities, immediately comes uh, to your mind the question, uh, OK, is this just similarities, or are there maybe some formal ties? Uh, so the first question is, whenever you have a combinatorial dynamical system, does it model some classical dynamics? And in what sense? Because this is just an example. We see the same conley morse graph. Can we do this always? So for that, we gave a positive uh, answer uh, in some respect, at least, with Thomas Warner. Namely, we proved uh, that uh, given a Morse decomposition of a combinatorial vector field on a simplicial complex, there is a sem semi-flow on the geometric realization, which admits uh, a Morse decomposition with precisely the same uh, Conley uh, Morse graph. So this construction is always possible. You and always uh, can. Uh, uh, build something which may be uh, uh, so that your combinatorial uh, dynamics is the model of this classical dynamics. Uh, so today I'd like to show some extension. Uh, it's it's work in progress, but uh, we already ca can say something towards the second question. Can we extend this also to recurrent behavior? When we see some structure inside a strongly connected component, uh, in the combinatorial dynamics, can we carry it over to uh, the uh, classical uh, dynamics? For instance, when we see here a periodic orbit in a Morse set, a, a closed uh, um, path in this directed graph, does it mean that there must be also a periodic orbit in the corresponding Morse set? Uh, actually, uh, the answer to this question is related to the third question, which goes in the opposite direction. Uh, you may now start with a classical dynamical system and you may ask, could I model the dynamics of this classical dynamical systems via a mm, simple combinatorial uh, model? Of course, here uh, immediately you can say that uh, this is naive to expect a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence because uh, the dynamics uh, in, in classical uh, setting may be just simply too rich. But at least you may ask for some approximation schemes. Uh, so uh, at least on some level of uh, details, could we carry over and represent this uh, in the combinatorial fashion? OK, so uh, and in order to explain how we came to some conclusion about the second question, I have to say a little bit about the proof of this theorem. And to speak about the proof, I want to mention some limitations of combinatorial vector fields. So they are limitations from the point of view of dynamics. Uh, uh, Foreman came with this concept just to build uh, uh, Morse theory. And this, uh, this is uh, very, uh, for this purpose, this is completely sufficient. But here is, uh, so there are several reasons we are not completely happy uh, when we want to model dynamics. Here is one of the reasons I hope uh, uh, convincing. So when we take just uh, a saddle and saddle on the plane, uh, then it's easy to give a combinatorial model. Uh, then this uh, uh, singleton, which represents this uh, stationary solution in the middle of the saddle is represented by an edge. And then the uh, stable manifold consists of these two uh, squares on the left and uh, right, where the trajectories, you remember, you are allowed to move anywhere to the boundary uh, from the end of the explicit arrow. So you can just go towards this fixed point. And then uh, you can continue to the boundary. Then maybe you rise dimension by one, but you'll never uh, reach a two-dimensional cell so this means that actually, if you would like to model a saddle-saddle connection with a combinatorial vector field, it's uh, uh, an immediate proof that this is actually not possible. 
So this is one of the reasons, uh, uh, there are, as I said, several other reasons that we need an extension of this concept, which I call combinatorial multivector field. And the, the idea is very easy. Uh, so you remember now I mentioned that the singletons and doubletons in formal theory are convex sets. So instead of allowing only singletons and doubletons, we take a partition where the sets of the partition just have to be convex. So this is the only condition. Uh, so this is the same uh, uh, situation uh, uh, represented uh, uh, together with the classical topology. This partition where I split this into this uh, four element multivector, three element multivector. Of course, the vectors are always allows. In this simple case, I just for some reason got rid of vectors, but I still have two singletons. So this is now the definition. A combinatorial multivector field is a partition of the set of cells of a cellular complex into convex, or using the uh, Alexandrov topology language, locally closed sets. This is in equivalent via this Alexandrov uh, correspondence. Uh, okay, uh, so, uh, uh, and now the, the dynamics uh, is uh, the same. You, you just uh, have this uh, directed graph now here where you have these up explicit up arrows and still this implicit down arrows. And the Conley theory uh, carries over to this generalization with all the, all the tools. So in terms of the Conley theory, this generalization puts no, no limitations. Okay, so equipped with this concept of uh, multivector uh, field, I can go to, uh, to the proof uh, I mentioned of the, the only theorem I showed uh, so far. So let's start again with the combinatorial um, uh, vector uh, field uh, on a simplicial complex, because um, our theorem so far uh, applies for uh, only for simplicial complexes. We believe this is just a technical uh, assumption, but the proofs are complicated enough even with this uh, simplified setting. So what we do is we uh, make a kind of blow up a new cellular uh, structure on this uh, geometric representation of the simplicial complex. I said the blow up because now every cell from the simplicial complex has a representation as a uh, top dimensional cell in this new cellular structure. So for instance, this vertex is now represented as this cell this uh, edge is represented as this yellow cell and so on. And we need this to uh, now define uh, on each simplex, we define a differential equation in such a way that uh, the flow lines of this differential equation cross transversally uh, uh, the faces of these new, uh, new cells. And then, uh, with all this, uh, we are able to prove what we want. And of course, there is a lot of details. I have no chance to speak about this here. But the reason I brought this part of the proof is because of this concept of transversality, uh, which uh, leads to this definition that uh, given now a, a cellular structure on the topological space X, so script X uh, stands for the uh, uh, cellular combinatorial structure. We say that a semi-flow on this geometric representation is admissible with respect to this cellular structure if every toplex, so top dimensional cell, uh, is crossed by solutions of this semi-flow transversally across the boundary. Additionally, um, we say that it's strongly admissible when we can revert the Wazewski theorem. So, uh, if we see something staying inside the cell, we allow that only if the relative homology, this sigma minus is like the exit set in Conley theory is, is non-trivial. So uh, this concept of admissibility is useful not only in this proof, it may be uh, used uh, potentially, so this nothing is done so far yet by us in this reverse direction in the approximation scheme, but this is how we would like to go on with this uh, concept. But uh, um, yes, so uh, you maybe remember Konstantin Stokes from Saturday, he mentioned that 
uh, ramp systems. Uh, on he showed a picture on the cubicle grid. Uh, so my feeling is that uh, uh, one of the reasons uh, they are useful in their approach is because uh, on this cubicle grid, we they actually can verify this transversality condition. So they also look similar situation as this uh, admissibility here. Okay, so now when you have such an uh, admissible uh, uh, cellular decomposition for a flow, you can actually use it to construct a combinatorial uh, multivector field. Uh, the idea is quite simple, namely um, you take a top dimensional cell, you look at the faces. This transversality uh, lets you decide whether the face goes in or goes out. So you just take the uh, this set. So there is this immediate future of each uh, cell well-defined. So this immediate future means that uh, every point enters a top dimensional cell. This is part of the transversality condition. So you take, uh, given a top dimensional cell, you take uh, all its faces which go inside this cell. And then you can prove that this way you actually obtain a combinatorial multivector field on the collection of cells. But more importantly, you not only this combinatorial vector field, uh, but uh, you can, so here is now just the combinatorial vector, uh, uh, multivector field. But you can do more. Whenever now you find an isolated invertian set for this combinatorial multivector field, and then when you go back to the geometric representation, you take all the cells in this isolated invariant set. I have to take here the closure because you remember the isolated invariant sets in the combinatorial setting need not be uh, uh, closed in general. So I take now the closure. And the, this uh, absolute value means just now take the union, go to the geometric representation. Then I get an isolating block for the semi-flow from which I started this construction and the Conley indexes are the same. And again, uh, this, so here is an example. This is an isolated invariant set for this combinatorial multivector field. This one actually is, is closed. Uh, maybe I should have chosen a better example. Uh, uh, because this is a kind of special one. And uh, its Conley index is actually a, the same as a Conley index of an attracting periodic orbit in the plane. So now the question is, uh, we see this combinatorial uh, isolated invariant set with the Conley index, such as uh, the Conley index of uh, a hyperbolic periodic orbit, could we claim that there must be a periodic orbit there? Of course not, we need some more assumptions. Uh, but before I show the main theorem, one more comment to the uh, Constantin's talk. He showed these Rook fields and the Janus complexes. I haven't learned yet the terminology right. So I'm not sure if I refer to Rook, Rook field or Janus complex. But again, he gave this example, which looks to me like transversality. And when you look just at that example, you precisely see this combinatorial multivector field which arises uh, from the, that, uh, that example. There is there a periodic orbit, uh, combinatorial periodic orbit in that example, but that uh, periodic orbit does not have the Conley index of a, a classical periodic orbit. So here is our main theorem. Uh, I assume that I have an isolated invariant set for this combinatorial multivector field arising from uh, this uh, uh, transversal flow. And I assume that uh, it uh, consists only of regular multivectors. Regular multivectors, I did not give the definition, but the idea is again uh, like the reversed Vashevsky. So uh, I do not allow things stay in the multivector unless the relative homology is non zero. And I assume that the Conley index of this isolated invariant set is non trivial and satisfies this equality. Uh, so, in particular, the simplest setting to satisfy this condition is just when you have a Conley index of a hyperbolic periodic orbit. So, this assumption actually comes from our old paper with Constantin and Chris McCourt, uh, where we do have a criterion for the existence of periodic orbits for classical flows. 
a part of this Conley uh, index condition, it also it requires the existence of, web, of a Poincaré section. So our theorem, and maybe I go immediately to this example again, because it would be easier to explain the assumptions, uh, is that we, of course, do assume that we have an isolated invariant set for the combinatorial system. We do assume that we have the right Conley index. But now, instead of this uh, Poincaré section assumption, uh, we uh, assume that you can split this collection of multivectors in this uh, isolated into, uh, invariant set into at least three families, um, ordered uh, modulo p, or modulo uh, uh, the number of the families. So here in this example, there are just uh, three in three shades of blue, such that, that only two, consecu two consecutive intersect. Uh, and uh, most importantly, whenever you look now for a path in this uh, uh, combinatorial dynamical system, so in this v-graph, when the easiest way is just to look into this v-graph, then when you start in one of these parts, you actually uh, stay there and either you leave entirely your isolated invariant set with the path or you enter the next one in this circular ordering of these uh, pieces. And under these assumptions, we uh, can claim that actually the, the classical uh, semi-flow uh, from which we started has a non-trivial periodic orbit inside this uh, isolating block, which I already mentioned. Okay, so let me emphasize here that uh, this, uh, is a different condition than requiring a Poincaré section uh, because we only uh, need this, this partition. And in practice, actually, it's even sometimes convenient to have this partition consisting of several pieces. Three is just the minimum. Uh, we tested this on a, a relatively simple example, uh, which is the Van der Poel equations. So uh, Justin uh, Thorpe, who is uh, Thomas Warner's student, made, made the computations. He actually managed to get this uh, transversal triang triangulation, which is not that easy uh, for the uh, Van der Poel system. And then he made the computation Oh, Mary, you're muted. Can you hear me now, did it? Okay. Could you just so, repeat uh, the last couple of sentences? I think we lost a bit of that. Okay, uh, so we... Justin made the computations. He actually managed to uh, verify, to construct this triangulation, which is transversal to the flow from the Van der Poel oscillator. Then he made the computations for the combinatorial dynamics, found an uh, isolated invariant set, uh, computed the Conley index, and then checked that there is this partition possible, uh, which we require in the theorem. So this way, this is just another proof uh, of the uh, computer-assisted proof of the existence of periodic orbit in, in, in this system. Uh, maybe... Uh, those who are familiar with uh, Eric Bochko's, uh, Bill Callis and Constantin's uh, paper from 2007, see the similarity. They did a similar construction there. Uh, they did not address the question of uh, the existence of Poincaré section uh, in that paper. So uh, they did not end up with a, a computer assisted proof. Uh, but they realized already there that this construction uh, is actually not, uh, not that uh, uh, easy, this construction of uh, transversal, transversal flow. The, uh, Justin's construction, is, it seems quite different because um, in that Constantin's construction, you get plenty of such uh, long and skinny uh, triangles. These look quite uniform uh, here. Okay, but uh, we have appetites for more and uh, we would like to get also a criterion for chaotic behavior. So I recall here the uh, uh, Williams model of Lorentz attractor from uh, 
1979 Williams paper, which is on a branched manifold, so like a con, con, uh, conjoint, uh, two conjoint uh, annually. Uh, his analysis of this example is again based, based on the Poincare map and on the certain smoothness assumptions about the Poincare map. We would like to do something similar using our combinatorial tools. So here is a combinatorial model of the Lorentz attractor. It's more here. This is this is not exactly the same as in the Williams example because there is a non-trivial Morse decomposition here. It consists of two periodic orbits here, on one on the left, one on the right. Uh, you see them here in the Conley Morse graph. There is a saddle here, this singleton here, uh, you see it here. And uh, when you go backwards, uh, you should also see uh, a repeller where uh, things should be uh, attracted in the reverse uh, time. Actually, it happens to have a trivial Conley index. Here is the repeller only. So now I just, uh, as I mentioned, an isolated invariant set in the combinatorial setting is a repeller if and only if it's open. So this is now open, uh, open set in this combinatorial setting. I remove these periodic trajectories. I remove the saddle point and I remove the connection from the saddle point to the periodic trajectories. What we are left with is an attractor. Uh, it's, uh, sorry, it's a repeller. Uh, it's clearly, uh, mm, Chaotic. The chaos in the combinatorial setting is quite trivial, which means that actually when you look in this, two, this V uh, graph, you have just two closed uh, paths, but uh, they share an edge, which means that, uh, and this dynamic is multi-valued, which means that you can actually switch whenever you want, and you can produce uh, any uh, kind of non-periodic trajectory uh, going uh, uh, along the edges of this directed graph. Okay, so now we can prove a theorem, uh, namely uh, from the, the previous one, we know since this example is just uh, built on a simplicial complex and this is a combinatorial vector field, we know that there is an associated classical uh, dynamical system, a, a, a semi-flow on this uh, branched uh, space. And uh, we actually can claim that every strongly admissible semi flow, so such a flow exists, and any such strongly admissible semi flow associated with the about combinatorial vector field is chaotic in the sense that there, there are infinitely many different itineraries of periodic orbits. Here, by itinerary, I just mean measuring uh, how you go around this, uh, the left and right uh, periodic orbit. You can do this also in higher dimensions. Uh, this is just a, a 3D uh, combinatorial uh, multivector field this time. We believe that something like this uh, should sit in the Lorentz attractor. Of course, to believe that it is there and to show that it is there, this is a, a long story, but it doesn't look totally hopeless. Uh, Justin already started computations in 3D and they seem to be promising. But uh, we still can claim that if there is a uh, um, strongly admissible semi-flow with respect to this uh, uh, combinatorial uh, dynamical system, then it has to uh, exhibit chaotic behavior. Uh, what is nice is that you can use this uh, combinatorial gadgets to build models in higher dimensions. In similar way, as we explained to our student, the nature of uh, Klein bottle or the uh, projective space, which cannot be represented uh, precisely in R3, but we can build these combinatorial models when you explain what is glued to what. So you can glue pieces uh, to produce a chaotic uh, combinatorial uh, vector field in four dimensions. This is again on a, a branched uh, manifold because uh, so that uh, I mark this, uh, these vectors here is this way that this face, the triangle is uh, the start of the arrow which goes into this tetrahedron and so on. 
So there are three tetrahedrons which share a phase ABC. One is here, one is here, one is here. But still there is a flow in 4D uh, which uh, follows this uh, dynamics of this combinatorial example and it's, it's chaotic. Okay, so let me go closely to, to the end with some, at this stage, more questions, but I think very interesting questions. So we saw this uh, V graph of our uh, model of Lorentz uh, example. This is a strongly uh, connected directed graph uh, with the feature that it uh, has two strongly connected subgraphs, the two loops. Uh, and we, I already explained that it uh, models this uh, chaotic behavior in the uh, Lorentz system. Uh, there are simpler, simpler examples of this type. <clears throat> the simplest one probably is just one closed loop, uh, one closed path with one loop. And then it models just uh, a homoclinic connection to a fixed point in a circle. When you add two loops, uh, you get uh, het uh, heteroclinic connections between two uh, fixed points. But you can easily imagine more complicated situations. Uh, so uh, here we have again a strongly connected directed graph with again two. Um, uh, non-trivial, strongly connected subset, these two loops, but they do not share an edge like in that example. So in that sense, this is different, but there are still connections. Uh, so for this one, uh, actually you can still claim chaotic behavior, uh, but uh, it's not clear what, how, whether this chaotic behavior would somehow differ from the chaotic behavior in uh, this construction obtained where the edge is shared. Uh, can we make also some distinction on the, in the classical setting between two, 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 two uh, versions of a chaotic invariant set? And you can go on with such question. This, this uh, uh, directed graph is again strongly connected, looks very much like the one on the left hand side, but this time there are three non-trivial strongly connected subsets. So the, at least the, the minimum question uh, would be the following uh, uh, question to answer. Whenever uh, you have a strongly connected uh, Whenever you have a combinatorial multivector field uh, with a, a strongly connected uh, Morse set in it, and you see in the default composition of this Morse set that there is a number of uh, minimal strongly connected subsets. So this minimal number here is two, here is two, but here it's, it is three. Also here it is three. In case of the classical dynamics, we can also look for the minimal non-decomposable chain recurrent sets in the classical dynamics. So now when you see a chain recurrent Morse set, you can still ask how many minimal chain recurrent Morse sets you can find there. And the first question you would like to ask is, Given the combinatorial dynamics, can you build the classical model so that the number of these minimal strongly connected uh, subsets or uh, chain recurrent sets coincide? I have no idea how these answers could be answered. Uh, let me mention that we have a project with my student, uh, Michal and Konstantin, about the concept of pseudomorphs decompositions. So a kind of an attempt to go inside a Morse set uh, and see the internal structure of the Morse set, in particular via non-trivial minimal chain recurrent subsets. And I hope that uh, with the ideas we developed there, there might be uh, some, uh, some answers. There is also a question of classifications here. Uh, Vidit uh, mentioned uh, this ear decomposition which is non-canonical, so I don't know how helpful uh, this would be. Uh, but I think there are several interesting questions here to be addressed. Uh, my other student, uh, Mateusz, uh, 
working in totally different direction about the Shimchak functor on the category of finite sets and finite relations does have some classification which might give uh, also some help in understanding uh, this kind of, of situations. Okay, so my time is practically over. Very briefly conclusions. So I want to emphasize that combinatorial dynamics similarly to combinatorial topology serves as a two-sided bridge between finite and continuous mathematics. And it has, uh, we see now that the resulting correspondence covers not only gradient, but to, at least to some extent also recurrent dynamics. And uh, what is probably most important, it provides again global results from local information. So in our theorem about the periodic orbit, all the tests uh, have to, uh, which have to be made are uh, local. You do not have to look for the Poincaré map, which is in principle a global task. Okay, so let me uh, stop here. This is just a list of earlier papers on this subject. Let me only mention in context of this conference that we have three, uh, we have uh, also ongoing work with uh, Tamal Day and other people about the persistence in the Conley theory. So what is nice here that the persistence in this setting seems to be much simpler to develop than in the classical setting, although I do believe that it makes sense in the classical setting too. So thanks a lot for your attention. Um, right. Thanks so much, Ryan. I'm going to try and clap. So if you can join me either virtually or physically, let's go, go for it. OK. Well, um, if you have questions, please just uh, post into the chat a queue, and then there will be a nice ordered list of people. Um, so I already see there's a question from Marzia. So go ahead, Marzia, un unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, hello, Professor, and thank you very much for your uh, very interesting talk. I have actually um, two questions, at least. Uh, the first is that um, uh, can we consider a combinatorial vector field defined by format, uh, the combinatorial version of Morse's Meldonum consistent, specifically because of the reverse direction that you were saying, because the uh, in most small dynamical systems, we know that if we don't have a, any periodicity, we don't have any periodic orbit, Smil himself uh, proved that that type of dynamic is uh, topological conjugate of the gradient vector field. And this is what we have in um, uh, discrete case two, where uh, Foreman uh, proved that if there is no uh, closed cycle, uh, our combinatorial vector field is the gradient of some Morse function. So can you just consider this as the combinatorial ver version of Morse's male dynamical system? Because we all also have a lot of other results uh, coming from this system. We haven't um, touched that subject yet, but it's definitely an interesting uh, direction to go to. Uh, so far, what all what I can say is that just the, the uh, Forman's result for combinatorial vector fields carries over to multi-vector fields in the sense of the uh, the existence, uh, so the characterization via non-existence of periodic uh, loops via the Morse function. So you can also do the Morse function. That's that's all what I can say so far towards this question but uh, for, of course it would be nice to 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 get a better characterization when you try to construct this classical dynamical systems from this combinatorial model so uh, by by most function you mean for every com uh, i mean this is also something that foreman himself proved i think that for every combinatorial vector fit you can define a uh, function which is like Morse type and it is constant on the element on the simplicity of a closed yes. cycle and it is decreasing along the passes yes. of uh, yeah. so this is what you mean by the Morse function yes. yeah okay um, and uh, for the multivariable uh, vector field uh, so, uh, sorry for the multi vector field um, do you know any way to compute homology or is it um, 
possible to com uh, compute homology of these things directly or how, how, how we can compute? It depends what you, you, what you mean by computing homology. So if you think about this as a tool to compute the homology uh, of the uh, space, then I wouldn't say it would help more than just the, uh, just the Forman's vector fields. Uh, the, the, the main reason for me for introducing these multi-vector fields is that they give you more flexibility if you want to model dynamics. But um, I, but I, I don't think... Have... That, but, sorry, there, I think there are some applications that we really need to consider higher dimensional um, invariants that, uh, sorry, um, not, not isolated invariants that's like what we have in the uh, main four months case, but uh, in some uh, applications I have recently heard that people in image processing and so on so, are- So it's quite, quite possible. You do have the, as I mentioned, you do have the connection matrix uh, theory here. And the connection matrix theory can be just considered as a homology theory on the uh, chains produced by the uh, Conley indices of the Morse sets. Uh, so yes, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it could be also useful. I haven't thought in these terms so far, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Kaylin, you have a question. Yeah, I just wondering, can you say a little bit more about the persistency in Conley theory? So uh, I'm wondering that I, I, I'm not sure where there will be something like a barcode things going on there in this, but, along this line. So that would require a separate talk, uh, but uh, <laughs> what, we, what we try to do is um, to, uh, first of all, to, to set up these uh, persistence modules for uh, Conley indices, it's more or less, like uh, building uh, um, uh, uh, tower of uh, index pairs for a sequence of uh, uh, dynamical systems. Uh, but I think the most interesting about this, uh, apart from certain applications, we use this uh, persistence, for instance, in the constructions of cons combinatorial multivector fields from, uh, from data. Uh, because there is, uh, again, a lot to, to speak about. Uh, it's not a straightforward thing how to, how to make these constructions and persistence there is uh, quite helpful. Uh, but probably most interesting from the point of view of dynamics is that you can capture <clears throat> via uh, persistence, uh, you can capture bif bifurcations in dynamical systems. You can think about persistence in the setting of Conley theory as, as the extension of Conley's concept of continuation. Conley studied uh, how far you can go uh, with, uh, uh, so you have a, now a space of dynamical system and you try to follow a path in this space and you try to keep your uh, isolated invariant sets which may travel in, in the space may even change shape, but you at least want to keep its uh, Conley index. But then you may come somewhere to the uh, boundary of the subspace where this mm -hmm. Conley index is well defined. And then you want to cross somewhere farther and then you lose isolation. When you lose isolation, the Conley index is not defined. But nevertheless, you might ask question whether maybe some generators in the Conley index are preserved when you go to mm -hmm. the other side. So it may be not the whole Conley index is lost, but only one generator is lost or you gain one generator. And this precisely happens uh, in bifurcations. And this is what you see. So this way uh, you, can, you can actually capture bifurcations via persistence of the Conley index. So maybe so, so much, uh, if you are interested, I can send you some references. Yeah, thank you. I'll definitely dig more into the papers. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Wojciech, time for a quick question and then we move a on. Quick question. So, I, well, I have two quick questions. One question is, uh, what if we, instead of uh, looking at the cos like simplicial complexes, look at, at cubical complexes and have the vector fields there? Uh, maybe that's easier to find these, uh, you know, to find these uh, uh, models where the, you know, where the flow are, are orthogonal. Uh, uh... 
Yes, uh, so you actually have uh, seen the, this, uh, what I mentioned in the uh, Constantin's approach. Okay. Uh, I believe that uh, the construction is uh, possible in general setting in terms of our proof uh, that you can construct this semi-flow. Uh, I would not see much difference. You need this blow up anyway. And the real trouble starts uh, more on the side of multivectors when you allow multivectors than what is the, the original uh, cellular decomposition. So yeah. in these terms, I believe this is more or less similar construction. All right, thank you. Okay, well, let's thank Marion again for a lovely talk and for patiently answering all our questions. Thank you, Marion. Thank you. Okay, uh, and now you can safely stop sharing the screen. Yeah.